Welcome to the Becoming Superhuman Podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to bring you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. This episode is brought to you by Udemy, the world's largest marketplace for online courses. To get all of my top recommended courses for just $15, visit jle.vi slash courses. Greetings, super friends, and welcome to this week's show. Today, we have a huge, huge treat for you guys although it is a paleo-friendly treat. Over the next couple of months, we're going to be doing a three, maybe four part series on paleolithic nutrition and the paleo diet. We're gonna be spreading these episodes out a little bit with different stuff in between to keep some variety, but we'll nonetheless be interviewing three to four of the top experts on paleo and the paleolithic diet. I know you guys are interested. I know you want to hear different experts who approach it from different angles, and we're going to handle it all on this show. This week, we're going to start with the biggest name in paleo, in my mind, and the guy who popularized it and made it into a movement. He's a former research biochemist, New York Times bestselling author of The Paleo Solution, a former powerlifting champion, He studied directly with Lauren Cordain, the originator of Paleo. He runs one of the top-ranking podcasts on iTunes. He's co-owner of the most influential CrossFit box, one of the most influential ones at least, and one of the top 30 gyms in America. He serves on the board of a bunch of different health-related companies. He's the CEO of something called the City Zero Movement. He's a pretty busy guy, as you can tell, and on top of all of this, He is a powerlifting champion, as I mentioned. He's a coach. He's an athletic specialist. And he's just an unbelievable encyclopedia of knowledge about everything health. He's also a recovering vegetarian, which I find very interesting. His incredible story is matched only by the massive influence that he's had on millions of people's lives, getting them healthy, cleaning up their diet, getting rid of inflammation, preventing disease. So let me fill you in on the episode a little bit before we dive in. First off, like many episodes, we really get into the weeds, and I have to apologize, guys, I geek out a lot. But you guys are smart, and I know you can handle a little bit of the science-y stuff. You'll probably be able to tell that I'm a huge fan of this particular guest's work. I've read his books. I listen to his podcast regularly. And so I really tried to squeeze in as much good stuff as possible. And I managed to get a lot of great, great stuff in. So I'm sorry if it feels a little bit rushed, but I didn't want you guys to miss out on any of the wisdom that this guest had to offer. You'll immediately see that he has an encyclopedic knowledge of all things health, nutrition, metabolism, fitness, strength, you name it. I also have to say that he was incredibly generous with his time, and so it's a nice long episode where we get to explore a ton of different subjects, not just paleo nutrition. I know you guys are going to love this episode, and if you do, as always, please let us know what your favorite part was on Twitter or by email. Our handle is at Go superhuman. Okay, I know you guys are eager to know who this amazing mystery guest is, so it's time for the big reveal. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Rob Wolf. Mr. Rob Wolf, welcome to the show, my friend. I am a huge, huge fan, so I'm going to try and not be a complete fanboy and welcome you to the Becoming <laughs> Superhuman podcast. How are you doing? Well, thanks, man. A huge honor to be on the show. Thank you. Yeah, so I've been reading your book. I kind of got stuck because I'm inundated in writing projects, but I've been reading your book, listening to your show, and just love all the stuff you're putting out. So I'm excited to get into it a little bit. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks. You uh, sent me the most uh, detailed, extensive list of questions that anybody has ever done for an interview. So I'm excited. Really? I may not do any more interviews after this because this may answer every question <laughs> possible. Well, I hope so. That'd be awesome. We have an exclusive yeah. on your last ever interview. Drop the mic out. <laughs> I'll have to unclip it from the boom arm, but I'll make sure. Perfect. 
So tell me this, and I'm, by the way, going to pretend throughout this interview that I haven't read your book and listened to your podcast and all that stuff, and I'm going to play dumb for the benefit of our audience. Perfect. (laughs) So tell us the story of how you went. I know you were in the medical field, you were applying to med school, all that stuff. How did you come to become the name in paleo and and one of the most respected names in CrossFit and coaching? Tell us your journey. Oh, man. The best analogy I can have is I'm kind of like the Forrest Gump of fitness. Like I just ended up being at at the right place at the right time. And it it is really kind of funny. If you think about the movie, he co-founded Apple and the smiley face t-shirts and all this stuff. Right. I was a cancer and autoimmunity researcher, very interested in human nutrition and performance, was having some pretty significant health problems of my own and mainly related to gastrointestinal issues. And this idea of a paleo or an ancestral diet kind of got on my radar. I started researching that a little bit, found this guy, Art Devaney, another guy, Lauren Cordain, and started reading their research and writings on this. And it made a ton of sense. I tweaked my diet around. And at my worst, I had ulcerative colitis so bad that I was... uh, suffering horrible malabsorption kind of consequences, weighed 130, 135 pounds. I was a former California state powerlifting champion years before this, weighing about 185 pounds and could squat almost 600 pounds. So it was a, a horrible precipitous fall into illness and this uh, kind of ancestral way of eating really changed things for me. And so I got into the paleo scene, literally (laughs) like the cave floor, I guess, the subterranean floor. At the time that I contacted Lauren Cordain and went out to Colorado and started doing a research fellowship with him, there were maybe 200 people on the planet that would know what a paleo diet was. At that point, this was like 98, 99 Now, if I do a book signing in Reno, Nevada, where I live, we can pretty easily get 200 people to show up for that. So, I mean, it's really seen some pretty crazy growth. And then on the CrossFit scene, I was always poking around looking for updates on this guy, Art Devaney, because he had some very early influence on myself and other people in this kind of ancestral health scene. And he kept threatening to release a book, but it just was never happening. And so I would just search for his name and see if anything new popped up. And one day there was a website, crossfit.com, that had a link to Art Devaney. And so I went to the website and it, it was a blog before people really knew what blogging was. This is around like 2000, 2001. Oh, wow. They were putting up daily postings virtually identical to the format it's in today. Like they really have, have not updated much of anything on the main page, but it was blogging before blogging even had the term blogging. And, uh, They had lots of great information, but they had these really wacky workouts posted up there. And I started fiddling with those a little bit and really noticed some benefit to my performance. I was doing some capoeira and some Brazilian jiu-jitsu and stuff like that and really enjoyed it. And a couple of my friends, Nick Nibbler and Dave Warner. Nick is a former MARSOC Marine, like a spec ops Marine guy. And then Dave Warner was a, a SEAL. And we were all working out together and decided that it would be kind of cool to open a gym and we wanted to call it CrossFit. We wanted to give some attribution to the parent organization. And so I wrote the Glassman's an email basically saying, hey, can we open a gym and call it CrossFit North? And they were like, yes, please do that. We've been contemplating an affiliate model for quite some time. And so I wrote the first affiliate inquiry email ever and we opened the first affiliate, which was then... CrossFit North. And then I ended up moving back down to Chico, California about a year after that and opened the fourth affiliate, NorCal Strength and Conditioning, CrossFit NorCal. And then it's just been kind of off and running from there. That's incredible. And so yeah. fast forward, what is it now? 15 years and you're 15 years. Best selling yeah. New York Times author. You have, uh, in my opinion, one of the best health podcasts out there. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks. Incredible. So let's back a little, a little bit, just because I'm not sure our audience knows what the paleo diet is. And we're going to actually get Dr. Cordain on to talk about the origins of it. But why don't we cover the basis of really what we mean when we say paleo? I know this is probably the most elementary question we could ask, but... No, it's great. And it's always great to start with those fundamentals. And for me, it really goes beyond the diet. This paleo or evolutionary biology concept is really just taking a look at how our genes evolved over the course of time. We had a two and a half to three million year period of living as uh, foragers, scavengers, hunter-gatherers, and then 
about 10,000 years ago, earlier in some areas, later in other areas, there was this transition from the hunter-gatherer lifeway to the agriculturalist lifeway. And there were some anthropologically, archaeologically, there appears to be some impact to that change. The hunter-gatherer groups, which largely ate roots, shoots, tubers, fruits, vegetables, meat, fish, crickets, insects, a lot of variety, a lot of uh, variation based off of location and seasonality. But it's a, a way of looking at sleep and food and exercise and socialization and gut biome from an evolutionary biology perspective. So it's much more than just a diet, but the diet itself is really what's positing. Is there any benefit to emulating the way that our ancestors ate and lived given that our genes might be wired up significantly in that direction. And there's some new modifications in folks like uh, lactase persistence. Some people are able to maintain the ability to digest lactose throughout life. Malaria adaptations like uh, sickle cell anemia is one of the most prevalent and highest penetrance of any genetic modification since uh, Neolithic times. So, I mean, humans have definitely continued to evolve, but it's still just asked this question, are we fully evolved for this modern life way. And if we are, then why are we seeing the degree of degenerative diseases that we see? And if we aren't, what do we need to do to maybe affect some changes in a favorable direction? So I it, love it. it gets portrayed as just all kinds of crazy stuff. But when you do physics, the fundamental elements of physics are quantum mechanics and Newtonian classical physics. And without quantum mechanics and relativity, like we don't have cell phones. We don't have GPS satellites. None of that stuff works. If we try to make sense of the way that continents move around the planet, we need plate tectonics and some foundational theories like that. In medicine, medicine being a subdiscipline of biology, the foundational tenet of biology is evolution via natural selection. And so the paleo term is actually somewhat unfortunate, but it's not something that was just picked by people at random. When Lauren Cordain and Boyd Eaton really got in and started looking at this stuff, they found this reference to the paleo diet from anthropologists and archaeologists who had observed that pre-agricultural hunter-gatherer folks who ate what you would call a paleo-type diet were remarkably healthy, that right. they didn't seem to suffer cancer, diabetes, heart disease in the ways that Western populations do. Sure. So it's not like a couple of... Uh, this wasn't a marketing ploy. This is something that grew out of the science of anthropology and archaeology naming this term a paleo diet, but a probably evolutionary diet would have been a better place and it would have provided more latitude for acknowledging the changes that have happened, say, in like Asian populations having increased uh, amylase gene frequency and probably handling carbohydrates much better than, say, like Native Americans. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Does that explain kind of the prevalence of rice and why there's significantly less health concerns around that in Asia? Potentially, yeah. I mean, it, there's all kinds of interesting adaptations there. Like, And uh, Rhonda Patrick is a phenomenal researcher. I actually listened to her podcast quite a bit. And she was mentioning that there are some morphological changes in the gastrointestinal architecture of, say, like most Asian populations relative to, say, like Amerindians, for example, where the Amerindians have shorter, large intestines, the Asians have longer, large intestines, which means that it lends itself more to fermentive breakdown of cellulose and fermentable carbohydrates and stuff like that with commensal bacteria. And so there are some changes and there are changes in the amylase gene frequency. And the amylase gene is really interesting. And I know I'm bouncing all over the place here, but uh, amylase is used in breaking down starch in the food that we eat. But it's also really interesting that the people who have the greatest density of amylase gene activity, they break down starch very well. But interestingly, they also have a very, very healthy insulin response to carbohydrates. Oh, interesting. And then people who have a lesser amylase gene frequency don't break down carbohydrate as well and have a poorer insulin response to carbohydrates. So there are some hardwired genetic features in there, but something that's really important to keep in mind is that even the most amylase gene deficient human has much more starch or carbohydrate digesting capacity than say like chimpanzees. And something that folks, particularly in the vegan scene, kind of forget when we look at our great ape cousins, 
is that the bulk of the calories that the great apes get from the food that they eat is actually from short chain saturated fats because they're breaking down the undergoing cellulosic fermentation similar to what happens with termites and they're making these short chain saturated fats which then kind of diffuse into the circulatory system and so those animals are actually fat fueled oddly right. enough which brings us back to the paleo diet really which kind of circles back around to the paleo diet right some of the changes that appear to have happened that may have been synergistic with our evolution is uh, scavenging, cooking, uh, cooking of both meat and uh, starchy tubers, and the development of uh, some rudimentary tool usage, which would allow us to open up the long bones and the brain, you know, the skulls of animals that had been left, either killed outright or left from other animals killing them. And these were huge reservoirs of calories and nutrition that were largely unused by any other critter because they mm. simply couldn't get into them. And so, you know, it's some interesting confluence and uh, suggestive of some of the, the ways that we evolved as humans. That's really interesting. There is this impression. And one of the things that I really took away from the book, we have this idea as a society that life was very brutish before agriculture, but in fact, they were healthier than we were and they had less calories and better bone density and just even better height. And then also we have this impression that the reason that we all get sick and we all die of all these horrible things like cancer and diabetes and cardiovascular disease is because we're living longer. But in fact, that's not true either. So that was kind of a big takeaway for me from the paleo solution. Yeah. One of the common counterpoints is why would you want to eat in a way that the average lifespan of the people was 30 years? And it's complex on that a little bit. Uh, Boyd Eaton actually wrote a great response paper to that. But the bulk of the decreased lifespan is attributable to injury, infection, and high infant mortality rates. Well, and once violent you look, death, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, hunting and gathering and even just... Tribal warfare. <laughs> tribal warfare and murder were reasonably high. A guy, Robert Lee, wrote a book, Kung San, Men, Women, and Work in a Foraging Society. And he did a really interesting analysis of the rates of murder and violence within these groups. And it was reasonably mm -hmm. high. Mm -hmm. It was not unappreciable. And so if you remove antibiotics, you remove emergency medicine, you remove the ability to set bones and deal with uh, uh, birth complications, you have a really high early mortality rate, it, which skews things kind of a uh, unfavorably. But when you look at the number of folks that actually lived into advanced age, if a uh, Hunter-gatherer individuals lived into their 30s. They were as likely as we are to live into their 60s and 70s. And this is part of something called the grandmother theory, which is basically most organisms, once they pass reproductive age, they're gone. And mm -hmm. humans, that's not the case. They can spend upwards of 50% of their life in a non-reproductive status scenario. And that's because we have very complex culture and we have an incredibly long a developmental period for our offspring. And part of what we need in that whole story, the economic uh, story, is that we need learned grandparents to both contribute to child rearing, but also to convey culture and information. Interesting. So we are actually incredibly well adapted for a long lifespan. And if people are really going to get in and try to make a case that the paleo diet is suspect because the average lifespan was about 30 years, once we shifted to an agricultural life way, like in the early Roman period, the average lifespan was about 19 to 20 wow. years. And that was because of living in tight proximity with other people and really heightened disease burdens and whatnot. And so if you want to follow that chain of logic, like yeah. it, it actually ends up backfiring on you. And it was only, you know, the late eight, mid to late 1800s that we started getting some early elements of epidemiology, public health, sanitation, that we really saw the average human lifespan start to go up because we started getting a handle on infectious disease and some of these uh, sanitation issues. Sure. So essentially it's to kind of break it down. It's a diet that avoids grains and products, which we would not have access to without modern kind of agricultural techniques. So no dairy, no grains, not even quinoa. What's the big deal with gluten? And I know in your book, you explain that dairy and quinoa and buckwheat and all these other things have similar contents in them 
that are equally as bad for the body as gluten. And I think a lot of us hear about gluten-free and a lot of people choose to be gluten-free without understanding what really the issue is. Yeah. And so again, from kind of an evolutionary biology perspective, everything in biology has horns or thorns or teeth or poison or something like everything's trying to eat something or avoid being eaten by something else. And say like with quinoa, quinoa has what's called uh, saponins, which are these soapy type substances, which really kind of dissuade critters from eating them. And beans have some protease inhibitors, gluten and say like wheat germ gluten and some other proteins found in wheat, rye, oats, barley, millet. Uh, they're anti-predation chemicals. And what gluten does specifically for celiac individuals is it can upregulate a protein called zonulin. And zonulin increases intestinal permeability, and this is where an autoimmune disease called celiac can occur in susceptible individuals. Another protein called wheat germagglutinin is just generally an immune irritant in many people. And so you can have non-celiac gluten intolerance, which is another term. And there's lots and lots of proteins in these plants that are potentially pretty problematic for humans. And if you look at some of the Weston A. Price literature on this stuff where we look at cultures that more successfully consume grains they tended to soak these things sprout them ferment them and this is all attempts to mitigate these anti-nutrients that are in these products interesting i like that term anti-nutrients yeah and if i were to ask somebody would it make sense that you should be able to eat a banana peel Right. Absolutely not. So why not? Again, I find it all of the theory and all of the battles kind of go out the window if we just couch this stuff from an evolutionary biology perspective. So banana peel, what's the banana peel doing? Right. It's protecting the fruit itself. Yeah. And even though fruits are kind of a cost benefit trade off, like the plant is putting some energy into this stuff and there's an expectation of something eating it and then dropping those seeds off someplace else in a warm, nutrient-dense, yeah. compostable matrix, there's still a time element to that. And so the plant, and I don't want to overly anthropomorphize it, but they, quote, don't want this stuff to be consumed too soon. But the skins of different fruits, if there's a toxicant load, you'll find it in the skin or say like with stone fruits, the seed of say like a, a plum or a peach is loaded with cyanide type compounds right? because it's trying to prevent itself from beaten by mold and fungi and other organisms. So these things that are the reproductive structure of plants really get protected rather vigorously. And so this is the problem with things like quinoa and millet and wheat. That really is the reproductive structure. And so what we try to steer folks towards in general is uh, more like yams and uh, sweet potatoes, uh, which themselves have anti-nutrients, but cooking tends to mitigate that. Avoiding mm. the skins tends to mitigate that. And my greasy used car salesman pitch is try something that looks more like a paleo diet than not. If you have health problems, get healthy 30, 60, 90 days later, sure. then reintroduce these other foods and see how you do. If you do fine with millet, then eat millet. I don't have any dog in the fight, but what I've <laughs> found is that a lot of people have significant health problems ranging from GI issues to autoimmunity, uh, neurodegenerative diseases, and they really seem to benefit from something that looks pretty close to this paleo type diet. Yeah. If they have some insulin resistance, it maybe needs to be lower carb. If they don't have insulin resistance and they're a high level athlete, then they need more carbohydrate and maybe they benefit from some white rice and white potatoes and stuff like that, you know? And, and so if we were to use a dartboard analogy, for most people, this general paleo template gets them about 80% there. And then you need to tinker and fiddle and be reasonable about who you are and what your goals are and what you're trying to achieve. And then that will kind of direct you in, in the customization path to get you where you want. It'll give you that extra 20%. I can tell you've been yeah. hanging out with Tim Ferriss recently. You're talking in 80 20s. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, that Pareto law thing, it, not to wax too philosophical on this, but if people have a decent understanding in evolution, economics, and mathematics, and a, a smattering of history, you can really make a lot of deep insights into many things. You won't know the details, but you can make some pretty informed decisions about a lot of different things in that Pareto, Gaussian distribution, 80-20 exactly. thing. It's a power law distribution, and totally. all of nature is governed by power laws. Totally. I live by it. I yeah. am constantly doing this 80-20 thing. Let me ask you this. To mention Tim Ferriss, by the way, I tried out slow carb before I went on paleo, and 
I spent a lot of time thinking about fruit and the fact that as a hunter gatherer, we didn't have access to huge amounts of ripe fruit year round, right? You can eat a, uh, let's say cucumber or a tuber at any point. You can't really eat a not ripe banana, as you mentioned before. So is it true that we spent less time eating fruit and are not adapted to that much fructose or is it kind of eat as much uh, fruit as you eat vegetables and no big deal kind of thing? That's a great question and I don't have a good answer. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I really, I think that's a little bit of an individual thing. We have uh, Luther Burbank our fruit to be much larger, much sweeter, much tastier. Most naturally occurring fruits are pretty small and actually kind of bitter. And when you look at a wild banana, you wouldn't even recognize it for a modern banana. Like exactly. it, it doesn't look anything like it. But that said, at the end of the day, are these things poor choices for food? It's kind of hard to make an argument against it other than if we see clinical or lab related indications that you're just not tolerating these foods. Right, and, you're and so insensitive, stuff like that. Exactly. I do a lot of work with police, military, and firefighters. And these people, because of their shift work, nighttime operations, deployments, time zone changes, and then just general shift work stress, these people are massively insulin resistant from sleep. We're not even talking about food yet. And so right. with these folks, is it reasonable to feed them a really high carbohydrate diet all the time? No, this is part of the problem that they face and why we see such staggering rates of uh, diabetes in these folks. So the problem is that we need some heuristics, some simple big picture stories to be able to reach a lot of people. But then people turn the heuristic into 10 commandment laws that then make it almost impossible to have any granularity to be able to dial right. this stuff in for individuals. Right. And so it's almost like a microscope that needs to go from low magnification to high magnification and back and forth so that we see big picture and more mm. granular elements to this. And so is fruit a bad thing to eat? I don't generally think so. Although I could make an argument Again, from the amylase gene story that maybe we're better adapted to eat starch like tubers and maybe even properly processed legumes or something like that. Oh, interesting. Like we might do a little bit better in that regard. Lots of people that have gluten issues, they tend to have fructose malabsorption issues. And so those folks don't do well on fruit or the types huh. of fruit that they do better with are like berries versus apples are quite high in fructose. And a lot of people with gluten issues don't do so well with apples. Interesting. But this is where it becomes kind of almost mind numbingly detailed because, you know, everybody's a unique snowflake and you have to figure out what the, <laughs> the logic tree for figuring out their story. But I could maybe make an argument that maybe we're better adapted towards dealing with cellular starch components like minimally processed potatoes, sweet potatoes, maybe even like lentils and legumes and stuff like that that are sprouted and soaked. And uh, folks might end up doing better on those than what they may do on a lot of fruit. But again, I think that this is kind of these logic trees where you try a while where it's like, well, I'm going to do the bulk of my carbohydrate from seasonal fruit. How do you look, feel and perform? Yeah, man, I'm gassy and bloated and my food looks the same coming out as it went in. <laughs> okay, let's shift over to more of a, a starchy tuber, maybe some fermented legume type deal. How do you do with that? Oh man, my digestion's great. I had a couple of days of gas and bloating, but then I had these amazing poos that look like a 14 year old's uh, poop and so on. <laughs> I'm great. So that's where we really need to stay open to fiddling and tweaking uh, this stuff. And the ancestral model is really great for asking questions. It is terrible for providing definitive answers. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and it sounds like it's so individualized, but coming back to the 80-20, it's avoid processed foods. That's already 60% of yeah. the benefit, right? You stop yeah. eating garbage out of a plastic bag. And the other thing is try to minimize your kind of refined carbohydrate intake, your grain intake. One thing that I took away from your book is really your body doesn't need to consume carbohydrates. You have all these mechanisms, as long as you have enough fiber and enough micronutrients, you have all these great mechanisms to create fabulous energy out of fat. And uh, at least that's how I understood it. Maybe I mistook it. <laughs> no, that's a great point. The caveat that I'd throw into that is the book's six years old now. And so I've learned some things from like Paul Jaminet. Well, it does seem like for a healthy gut microbiota, 
We want a base level of some fermentable carbohydrate to keep the bacteria and the mucosal layer of our gut happy. What does that look like? So things like Jerusalem artichokes, dandelion greens, uh, chicory root. So there's ways of doing that. And you can still be on a low-carb diet, but you can also do potatoes or rice that have been cooked. And then you refrigerate them and it increases the uh, resistant starch content of those items. Interesting. Green bananas have some good fermentable carbohydrate. Interesting. So it's another layer of the onion. You know, from a metabolic perspective, do humans need to eat carbohydrate? No, you could make an argument they don't. But we also are starting to understand that for a really healthy gut microbiota, we probably need some fermentable carbohydrates in the mix to really keep that happy. And if we keep that happy then I think that our tolerance for carbohydrates and a host of other things is actually a lot better. But this is where, again, it gets really complex. You take an individual, like if I'm working with some folks in the military and they're in a pre-deployment scenario, they're training hard, but they generally sleep well, they're at home, everything's pretty good. Then when they deploy, they're in a hyper-vigilant, stressed environment, they're on night ops, so they're up all night, they sleep during the day. They use Ambien to go to sleep. They use stimulants yeah. to wake up. Their vitamin D levels plummet because during the day they're either inside or they're in full military kit. And these people will end up having a dramatic shift in their gut microbiota. Their hormonal axis will completely shift towards a catabolic state. And so, again, those people, I would argue that probably a generally low carbohydrate approach, maybe targeting carbs in a post-workout period would be a good way to both feed the gut microbiota, but really limit the hyperinsulinemic effects of just being insulin resistant from their lifestyle. Interesting. It becomes really important to think about the individualization for these folks. And again, it's super frustrating for me because for the masses we try to get a simple story that gets as many people moving in the direction we need as possible. But then a lot of people need significant customization to really get them to the final point that really works for them. Right. I am glad to hear you say that we need some level of fermentable carbohydrate because, man, I miss potatoes. And let me tell you, mm -hmm. it's not easy living in the Middle East without eating hummus. So... <laughs> Right. So look at hummus. What's the glycemic load and insulin load off of that? It's pretty low because it's so high in fat. There's so much tahini in it. Yeah. You need a private detective to find the glucose and the insulin response to that. Right. But let's run through two potential scenarios. Uh, one person has had a lot of shift work. They did four courses of antibiotics in the last five years, and they have a really altered gut microbiota. Another person has slept well, they work outside, they drink some well water that has some good homeostatic soil organisms in it. They had one round of antibiotics when they were like 10, and other than that, they're like Wolverine. <laughs> that hummus for the really healthy person is probably a phenomenal option. The hummus for the individual with the altered gut microbiota could be a disaster because they may be suffering from small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, so they have abnormal levels of bacteria growing too early in the gut. They maybe have a shift in the types of bacteria, so it's more pathogenic versus beneficial. So what we need to do with that person with the altered gut is we need to figure out how to fix the gut. And usually a first stage with that is some low-carb kind of eating, shifting towards less processed foods, mitigating stress, mitigating sleep disturbances, maybe really aggressively repopulating the gut with a pre or probiotics. But even that gets a little bit dodgy because the same things that feed the good bacteria are the same things right. that feed the bad bacteria. And so it becomes a, a challenge to get all that stuff right. I had good friends, uh, Chris Kresser, Grace Liu, uh, Dr. Michael Ruscio, who play with these things all the time. It's not for an ill individual. It can be a really big challenge. But for somebody who say like they – want to go to the CrossFit games or they're just really active at CrossFit or something like that or jujitsu or what have you, is doing some hummus a good option? Probably a phenomenal option. I love it. I'm so glad, man. You just yeah. made all my yeah. countrymen happy. <laughs> <laughs> just to wrap that up really quick, what do we do to assess the validity of that? How do you look? How do you feel? How do you perform? Maybe you check blood work before and afterwards and you just see how you do. Then that way it's not opinion. It's your N equals one experiment. I love that. Yeah. Again, you've been hanging out with Tim Ferriss too much. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I want to ask in regards to, we've talked about probiotics, we've talked about fermentation. How do you feel about kombucha? 
Oh man, I have very little exposure to kombucha. It's really taken off in the States. Mm -hmm. You can buy it at Costco now. I was hanging out with my friend, uh, John Wellborn, and uh, he's like, hey, have you tried this? I'm like, isn't this just basically drinking a soda? And he's like, dude, try one. And I tried it. And I was like, so do you have like 12 more of these? Yeah, yeah. The commercial stuff is really delicious. I've never actually grown it at home. It seems like a pretty good option for a probiotic infusion. There are some indications on some medical websites that occasionally these uh, homebrew options, people can kind of screw them up or like the culture yeah. can get messed up and you can get like a really pathogenic critter exactly. growing yeah. in there and it can crush you. You got to be so dumb though to like not, if you don't see black mold in your beverage, I don't know what you're doing, you know? Right. And I brew it every week and I drink it every day. Oh, nice. and it's, yeah. It's like, I got to send you a SCOBY or something. Yeah, uh, do it's it. the easiest thing. And it's like, uh, I drink it instead of beer because I don't drink alcohol anymore. And it's anti-inflammatory, massive analgesic effect, which I didn't know. And I was drinking it and I had kind of some real bad soreness from uh, squats. And all of a sudden I'm completely pain free for a hey, few let, hours. Let me ask you this. Yeah. I'm reasonably sensitive to caffeine. Does it end up metabolizing any of the caffeine or theobromine or anything out of the, the tea? Like, can you drink it in the afternoon, and not have it affect your sleep? Super good question. You start out with actually pretty weak tea. And then as mm. I understand it, it does metabolize a lot of the caffeine. Okay. Theobromine is more active in yerba mate, which I mix in in my kombucha as well. But most of the tea you're using is pretty high in like L-theanine and caffeine. And I think most of that stuff's uh, metabolized. I can tell you when I drink it, I don't get the same buzz as when I drink a cup of black tea. Gotcha. Okay. Because I can't tell you how many times like we've had a couple of bottles sitting in the fridge and I'll come in after being at the office all day and I'll, I'll grab one and I'm almost ready to down one. I'm like, oh, it's four o'clock. I'm not going to sleep tonight. And so I put it back in and then I just don't feel right drinking it in the morning. And so I had a couple of them sitting in there for a while. So yeah, it's my afternoon uh, kind of digest. Pick if, me up. If you will. Nice. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Let me ask you this. Speaking of drinking non-water things, which is always kind of a touchy thing for me, I think that's the only non-water thing I'll drink. What do you feel about protein powders? There's a big debate there in the paleo community. Oh, man, it really depends on the person. A lot of people that have weight issues, I don't like seeing them do liquid food because it really doesn't provide the same satiety as solid food. Yeah. Here's my crazy, greasy, used car salesman, horrible capitalist pitch. I just want to see people eat real food and chew it. Yeah. And somehow, like, I'm still like a huge asshole for saying that. <laughs> But that said, if you have a hard training athlete, if you have somebody that's just really on the go, they don't have body composition issues, they don't have insulin resistance, but they're like, listen, man, if I do a shake in the morning that I'm getting some protein, some good fat, I throw some kale or whatever in there, so I'm getting some veggies, I'm out the door and I feel like that's way better nutrition than what I would get otherwise. And it's like, fine, yeah. that's a great cost benefit mitigation deal. Right. But I do see that there are a lot of people that will end up creating like a thousand calorie shake. They down that and yeah. then like an hour later, they're hungry again because it just doesn't have the same satiety, neuroregulation of appetite effects that whole real foods do. Yeah. I, one of the things I was blown away in your book, and I actually want to plug your book because you go into such detail about each and every one of the hormones that provide the sensation of satiety. And I had no idea. I thought it was going to be one or two chemical signals, but there's different ones triggered by different things, different fats and proteins. And exactly right. Like when you drink a shake, you don't get that signal to the brain. Right. And this gets out in the weeds a little bit, but we've been in a protein, carbs, fat war for 50 years. What's the right ratio of protein, carbs, fat and all this stuff. And really at the end of the day, for people to be healthy, we need to figure out how they can eat such that you have a group of people that say it's only about calories and you have another group of people that say, no, it's all hormones and insulin and stuff like that. And the only calories people will cite metabolic wards where people are literally, they're basically locked in a hospital prison setting and every scrap of food they eat is monitored. Their poo is collected. Their pee is collected. They know what their metabolic output is. And we are thermodynamic machines. And so the calories in, calories out model is largely true. But those same people completely ignore the reality that free living humans 
are not in fact living in a metabolic ward and we have to make right. choices. And so if we are faced with a plentitude of hyper palatable foods, will we eat only to satiety? Almost never. There's a great video piece from the Food Network where he's doing an ice cream eating challenge and he needs oh, to man. eat eight pounds of ice cream in like 20 minutes or 30 minutes or something. And he gets about four or five pounds of ice cream in and he completely bogs down. And then he asks the waitress at this diner that he's doing this thing for some very crispy, extra salty French fries. And he eats these. Now, from a dietetics perspective, like a dietitian, they'll just say, when your belly's full, then you're done. Well, his belly was full. And when he put French fries into his belly, he was even more full. But that salty, savory, crunchy palate cleanser allowed him to finish the ice cream, whereas minutes before that, he was dry heaving and almost throwing up the ice cream. Oh, yeah. I've seen this, I think. Yeah. Adam something. Adam, yeah. Man versus food. Yeah, yeah. Man versus food. Yeah. And so we eat in Western societies, we eat like professional eaters. We have <laughs> all these hyper palatable foods. We eat them in a sequence where when we get bored with one food, then we switch to another and another and another. And so, you know, whether you're talking about paleo or vegan or what have you, or even when you talk about uh, people will mention the blue zones, you know, where people live longer and they're looking at the specific type of foods that they eat. All of the things that are one characteristic that nobody has really talked about in all these stories is that limiting food options is probably the most successful strategy towards affecting some sort of uh, long-term dietary change. Yeah, that's my secret. I just don't have food that I shouldn't be eating in my fridge. Right. It's like super right. simple stuff. But for most dietitians, they think that that is disordered eating because there are some people that can be what's called moderators. They can have a little bite and they're done. And then other people are abstainers. They just can't have any. And it's about a 50-50 spread in the population. And so yeah. what most of dietetic science is telling us is that if you aren't a moderator, then you are orthorexic and you have an eating disorder. But the reality is that the information that's coming out of dietetics is dooming about 50% of the population to immediate failure. And then I would still question, are Twinkies a food group? Are Lay's <laughs> potato chips a food group? If we started getting some characterization of how hyper palatable these foods are, then it needs to be looked at with the, we are nervous about um, making opiates generally available to the populace because they're very addictive and can have all kinds of downsides to them. Maybe we need a similar degree of care or nervousness around highly processed, hyperpalatable foods. Yeah. Interesting. I love that idea. So Rob, let me hit you with kind of a lightning round because yeah. as you mentioned earlier, I wrote out probably way too many questions. And I think we're going to have to invite you back, although I know it's very difficult to find time. So let me hit you with a lightning round for now, and we'll kind of do some short form questions. Sound good? Cool. Sure. Straight dope on organic produce versus non-organic produce. What are your thoughts? Organic is, in my opinion, very important from a long-term sustainability standpoint, not as big a deal on a nutrient standpoint, but I, I think it's a, a move in the right direction. But folks should not make organic and grass fed. Like if you hit the excuse for failure, number one, I can't find organic produce. So I eat a bagel. Hit the excuse for failure. Number two, I can't find grass fed meat. So I eat a bagel. So that's something I actually really wanted to ask you next up yeah. is uh, it's actually pretty difficult to find grass fed meat where I am because we don't exactly have huge fields here in Israel. <laughs> right. So what's the thing on that? I mean, is it still better to eat such a heavy meat diet or should people be subbing out a lot of that meat for fish if you can't find grass fed? This is one of the kind of primary misconceptions of paleo. You can eat as much or little protein on it as you want. Mm. You need to find your own operating parameters on that. The Katavans eat almost 70% of their calories from taro and sweet potato and uh, they eat a lot of coconut and then they have a little bit of fish and pork. Inuit eat mainly animal products for like 85, 95% of the calories that they take in. So you can individualize this however you want to. And I would put your own individual health at the forefront of this. So if you're insulin resistant, you're probably going to need a little bit more protein, a little bit more fat from animal sources, 
rounding that out with nuts and seeds, olive oil, and then maybe some very low glycemic load carbohydrates like chickpeas or something like that. Mm. If you are more of a a go-getter athlete, you might not need as much protein and you might uh, greatly benefit from a more carbohydrate. So this is one of the, even Cordain's early papers on this, like there was a spectrum where you know, it ranged from a, a low of 10% animal protein in, in certain hunter-gatherer groups to a high of 90% in other groups. And even that spectrum shifted over the course of a year. Oh, interesting. So there's all kinds of variability in there. So don't get wrapped around the axle of thinking that there's one set macronutrient need in this whole story, 40, 30, 30 protein, carb, fat deal or something. You can be quite variable on that and still have great body composition, great performance. And so if you're concerned about, you know, sourcing or the economics of buying more meat or fish or something like that, just eat less. Interesting. And also, I would really encourage people to check out the Savory Institute and watch Alan Savory's TED Talk on reversing desertification using grazing animals. Interesting. All right, guys, I'm just going to hit pause really quickly to let you know that this episode is brought to you by Udemy. Now, a lot of you guys may know that I teach some of the more successful courses on Udemy, but you may not know that there are about 30,000 other courses from the world's top experts, and you can learn anything on Udemy from programming to a new language to how to sleep better and even how to improve your relationships. Udemy is all about becoming superhuman, and for that reason, we've teamed up to give you guys a very special exclusive discount just for listeners of this podcast, so you can get any of my top recommended courses for just $15 a pop. And if you guys know about Udemy, you know that courses often go for $200, $300, or even $500. So at that $15 price point, you can really afford to learn a ton of great stuff. To take advantage, visit jle.vi slash courses or visit the show notes for a direct link. So how important then is it that our fish is wild caught and our meat is grass fed? I think it's from the grass feeding standpoint, I think it's important from a sustainability standpoint. And that's the Alan Savory TED Talk piece where he makes the case that if we want to reverse desertification, the encroachment of desert into arable areas, we actually need to use smartly applied grazing animals to re-nutrify the soil and start sequestering carbon and increase water retention in the soil and, and whatnot. And so I think that Grass-fed meat is important from a sustainability standpoint. The wild-caught fish, it certainly has a better omega-3 profile than farmed fish, but Mm. at the end of the day, it's not a massive difference. But a lot of the farmed fish really does some pretty nasty ecological damage the way that they basically get a monocrop of fish and the type of food that they feed them causes some algal blooms and stuff like that. So from a sustainability standpoint, I would tend to go more with sustainable Wild caught, grass fed, et cetera. Nice. I'm glad you mentioned omega 3 and omega 6 because that's actually something I learned from you quite a bit, both in the podcast and the book. And this idea that our ratio of omega 3 and omega 6 is so wildly skewed to what it should be is the big deal there. I mean, I guess I wanted to ask you what the big deal is, but I kind of just spoiled the, uh, <laughs> spoiled the punchline. But is the issue there that it's just inflammatory or are there any other kind of detriments to having this high omega-6 diet that most people have? The big deal is that it it tends to be pro-inflammatory. Classic hunter-gatherer diet, pre-agricultural diet was pretty close to a one-to-one omega-3 to to omega-6. There was maybe a little variability in there. The modern diet tends to be certain samplings of the modern diet can be 40 omega-6 to 1 omega-3, which is very, very pro-inflammatory. Wow, yeah. Um, that, that's one piece. And then the types of both omega-3 and omega-6s that folks tend to get in the modern world are these uh, refined seed oils, which tend to be these short-chain omega-3 and omega-6s, which are very oxidizable, and they're poorly converted into the longer-chain EPA, DHA, and arachidonic acid that we need from the omega-3 and omega-6 families. And uh, it's an increased oxidative load. So it's pro-inflammatory because you're getting the wrong metabolic pathways fired up. And it's pro-inflammatory because these things are inherently oxidizable relative to, say, like olive oil, monounsaturated fats. 
Interesting. Okay. So the omega-3 eggs are one thing that I've switched to definitely. Although I heard on your podcast that a lot of these things being touted as superfoods, for example, chia seeds, we're not actually metabolizing the omega-3s in there. We need the chickens to do it for us kind of thing. It works better that way. Different people have different abilities to take the short chain omega-3s and elongate them into the EPA and the DHA, which are the forms that we actually need for proper functioning. And so having some of that in the diet is fine, but relying on that solely as your source of omega-3s can be problematic. Sure. And I know you're a huge advocate of fish oil supplementation. Yeah, but you know, I've got to say, I've really dialed my recommendations back on that. Like I used to recommend 10 grams of fish oil a day, and it's more one to two gram supplemental at, at this point. I've really uh, dialed my recommendations on that back. Yeah, although I still think it's incredible. There are very, very, very few supplements that I've ever heard someone in your position or the fitness industry say just about everybody should be taking X. One of them is magnesium, which I, mm-hmm. I know you're also a big advocate of. The other is fish oil. And I've heard just about anybody who's athletic should be taking creatine. Can you think of any others that are just about everybody should be X? Definitely everybody should be at a 30 to 50 nanomoles per deciliter of uh, vitamin D. And whether that comes from supplemental form or getting out in the sun, mm-hmm. I would definitely make sure that your vitamin D levels are good. That's one of the just gimme, so like uh, making sure that vitamin D levels are adequate. Right. I mean, as I understand it, you can't metabolize, is it calcium without vitamin D? Vitamin D is clearly involved in calcium metabolism, but it's one of the most potent anti-tumor agents in our body. Interesting. There's a few cell types that don't have a vitamin D receptor. I forget which ones they are, but most of our cells in our body have vitamin D receptors It's important in anabolic functions. It's important in immune modulation, which is germane both for cancer considerations and also autoimmune considerations, also for just basic like cold and flu type stuff. Yeah. Folks that have really low vitamin D levels, you have a correlation with higher rates of upper respiratory infections and whatnot. So the vitamin D is one of these things. If you get that into a good level, it's just almost a get out of jail free card. It's very important. I love it. How does that play in with the kind of importance of sunscreen? Man. Or am I completely out of the wheelhouse No, no, no. (laughs) It, It just gets really controversial. There was a great study, and Mike Eads actually referenced this in 2001 in his book, Protein Power Life Plan, which is an amazing book. Still, the fact it was written in 2001, it has so stood the test of time. And he had a chapter in there called Sunlight Superman, where they're basically making the argument to get safe, reasonable sun exposure. And there's some research that because of the anti-tumor effects of of vitamin D, there's an argument that you could, and I completely forget the numbers on this, but it it was like a hundred thousand to one or a million to one. Getting out in the sun can increase your risk of melanoma or, or other skin cancers. But if your vitamin D levels are adequate, it is dramatically decreasing your likelihood of all these other cancers. So hmm. it's kind of like you're taking on a tiny little bit of risk for a huge amount of reward. And basically the takeaway of this paper was that you could really make a strong argument that if people increase their basic sunlight exposure, that we would see much better overall health outcomes. And vitamin D is important in insulin sensitivity, neurodegeneration, inflammation, cancer, autoimmunity. And again, from this evolutionary biology perspective, you just look around and it, we evolved outdoors. Now, we right. definitely have different populations with different degrees of skin pigmentation. So if you are just a pale ginger of a Scottish <laughs> lineage, you need to be more careful about the way that you ramp up your sun exposure. If you are from Somalia and you have very, very dark skin pigmentation, then you've got much more latitude on that. But then the inverse of that flips. If your grandparents were from Somalia, but you moved to the Netherlands, you need to be really, really careful about maintaining adequate vitamin D levels because the overcast, the northern latitude and the shortened daylight, you're going to be at exceptionally higher risk for vitamin D deficiency symptoms. Yeah. And seasonal affective disorder, all this good stuff. All of that stuff. Fun stuff. 
Yeah. So let me shift gears back. I, we were going to do a lightning round and then I got way too sorry, interested yeah, in what I, you're I, talking I, yeah. about. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's always a good problem to have when the guests are too interesting. I sit there and I'm just listening instead of hosting. <laughs> Thank you. So let's see here. What are your thoughts on eating local? I know that's not typically in paleo doctrine, but I think to hear what you said on Twitter, it probably should be. Oh, man, I'm a huge fan of that. But what I'm really advocating for probably the next 15, 20 years, maybe the rest of my life is really going to be focused on this sustainability side of the story and really looking at, at a evolutionary biology approach to sustainability, which, again, like Alan Savory, Savory Institute, Polyface Farms mm-hmm. are really front and center with that. And I really have this idea in my head of increasing the decentralization of food production still relying on some of the centralized distribution features that we have. But I think it makes a lot of ecological sense. I think it makes some health sense. I think it makes some palate sense to eat the stuff that's pretty local. If you have somebody growing watermelons or cantaloupes or something like that locally, wouldn't you probably want to eat that versus stuff that was shipped to you from Chile? Yeah, and was picked before it was ripe. Yeah, that was picked before it was ripe. And there are some detractors on that whole thing. There's some people that will say the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages was local eating. You didn't eat from anything that was more than like five miles away from you and stuff like that. And there's some truth to that. So again, we're not trying to completely do some sort of historical revisionist thing. But energy is becoming a more scarce commodity There's all kinds of economic and political instability because of energy acquisition and stuff like that. And so I I think it makes a lot of sense, both from an ecological perspective and also kind of a geopolitical perspective to encourage some utilization of local resources in a more reasonable way. So, yeah. Awesome. Let me ask this, uh, kind of jumping around a little bit now, because I know we're almost about to run long. Let me know if you do have to go. I'm good. Whatever you need to do. I've got an hour before my next engagement. Awesome. You got to be careful offering that. As I said, I'm a huge fan. So (laughs) (laughs) how do you feel about dairy such as, you know, obviously not drinking a gallon of milk every day, despite your kind of powerlifting background, but how do you feel about cottage cheese, Greek yogurt, butter, things like that? Again, it's all kind of a individual perspective on that. Like if you do well with it, then go be achieved, knock yourself out interesting characteristics of dairy and even historically collected dairy. A good friend of mine, Pedro Bastos, who's at the university in Lisbon, he did a great paper at the Ancestral Health Symposium about three years ago where he looked at the the timing historically of pastoralists when they would uh, collect milk. And it was fascinating. Just instinctively, they collected milk when the growth factors that were in the milk were at their lowest. I don't know exactly how they figured this out or why they ended up doing this. From a human health perspective, it makes a lot of sense because we do see some interesting correlations with very early rapid growth that can be spurred by things like high-carbohydrate diets, dairy, IGF-1, and cancers. If you're sending a growth signal, that growth signal goes to both healthy tissue and potentially pathogenic tissue. And so traditionally collected dairy was collected at points in in time when it was low in these growth factors. The process of fermentation tends to decrease the growth factor potential. And so there was this kind of natural history of this whole thing that really mitigated what we would consider to be some of the deleterious health effects. Whereas I remember for a while there was recombinant bovine growth hormone type milk and there were actually some bodybuilding circles that were trying to figure out which 7-Elevens and stuff like that stock this stuff because there was a thought that it would be mega growth promoting. I think that the (laughs) RBGH has kind of gone the way of the dodo. But there is, I think, potentially a cost-benefit trade-off with the growth promoting elements of dairy versus some other health uh, considerations. If you have gluten intolerance or celiac, there are some proteins found in dairy that are very similar to gluten. And so there may be some cross-reactivity with that. Is there a concern because one of the things that I found so interesting in the book was you go into really how the body's breaking down a carbohydrate like, say, white flour, right? And that's a polysaccharide and the body's breaking it down into all these monosaccharides. And and so I started thinking about lactose, which is really another form of sugar and how, you know, if we're trying to avoid uh, insulin insensitivity, we should probably avoid those easy win 
sugars that come from lactose. Is that a factor? And I mean, I guess it's not as much of a factor in butter or cottage cheese, but probably in, you know, drinking skim milk. Yeah, that could be a factor. All the studies that have looked at milk specifically, like the full fat milk always won out over the the skim milk, just yeah. as kind of a, an interesting aside. If we're trying to minimize, say, like our glucose galactose load from dairy, which is what the uh, lactose itself is, is a, a disaccharide, fermented dairy is a great option because it ends up breaking it down into lactate and, yeah, Greek yogurts and whatnot. So that stuff gets out into the weeds where I see dairy being really, really important is if somebody has some sort of intestinal permeability and or if they have an autoimmune disease, which typically autoimmunity goes hand in hand with intestinal permeability. But hmm. a lot of folks that have, say, like some sort of gut issues, some sort of, say, like rheumatoid arthritis, they seem to do really well with the exclusion of dairy. And yeah. if you don't have those issues and it may not be as big of a deal, but it's kind of funny. I just can't describe the number of people that are like, oh, I've had dairy every day of my life. This seems kind of crazy. And I'm like pull it out for 30 days, see how you look, feel, and perform, reintroduce. These folks go through that process and they're like, wow, okay, the low-grade sniffles I had and joint inflammation go away when I remove the dairy, reappear when I reintroduce the dairy, and then the person just needs to decide what's the cost-benefit story with that. Like if they just absolutely love the dairy that they're consuming, then they're okay with a little bit of post-nasal drip. But for me, I can't really handle cow dairy at all. I can handle sheep and goat dairy just fine. I get serious joint achiness from a uh, cow dairy. And if I'm doing some Brazilian jiu-jitsu or something like that, and my hands are already kind of getting beat up, then the cow dairy will just make them really ache. I mean, just, just not good. Yeah. I, so I really got to send you a, a kombucha scoby. I'm going to figure out if FedEx will carry it because uh, not to come back to this, but it, it's really high in gluconic and glucuronic acid. Okay. So it's just essentially just like a nice healthy dose of glucosamine. Nice. So interesting idea. Hook a wolf up. I'll yeah, hook. I will. <laughs> we got to figure out if we can ship this jellyfish looking thing across the world. But if we can, <laughs> yes. I will do it for you. Okay, cool. What are your thoughts on artificial sweeteners, by the way? I mean, are they all bad? And if so, why? I think some things like stevia and xylitol are probably not a particularly big deal. You know, some people have said that things like aspartame are neurotoxins and whatnot. The thing for me is what are the foods or food-like substances that we typically see artificial sweeteners? It's like sodas and kind of junk food anyway. So... Do we really have a firm leg to stand on that that should be part of our regular diet? I just don't think so. If I have some mixed drinks, a cocktail gig or something like that, I'll go with some diet tonic versus regular tonic. But I have it like once a month. Yeah. But instead of just having corn syrup, which is all that you can find in the diet tonic, then I'll go with a um, little bit of aspartame, sweetened diet tonic, and it's no big deal. So I think in general, those are just the things that have artificial sweeteners in it. We really shouldn't be eating them anyway. There's some data that seems to indicate that uh, artificial sweeteners can bypass the neuroregulation of appetite. So basically, if you're consuming these things, it makes you want more food. There's some conflicting stuff where people who used diet sodas as part of a calorie-restricted diet actually had better success than folks who didn't use the diet soda. I don't know on that. There are some people that are like, oh, diet sodas should be part of every dietary regimen. And then we had clients that just, I really feel like a huge part of their problem was that they were consuming like huge amounts of diet soda. And then they just ate like cockroaches beyond that because their neuroregulation of appetite was not right. Interesting. Very observational, not any type of solid science with that. Yeah, I have to admit you've surprised me a little bit. And I think it shows how far your kind of development and understanding has come in the last six years, because part of me expected you to have these hard and fast rules. It's very interesting kind of how flexible and how N equals one your approach is. Uh, not that I'm disappointed at all. It's just very fascinating because in the book, you take the stance, you have to trust me, try it exactly like this for 30 days and then see how you feel. So I think that's really cool. Oh, thanks. And, you know, in a clinical setting, like when I'm working with people in the gym or if we have somebody come into our medical clinic, they need some lane lines initially. Right. And so they get some pretty tight lane lines. 
because people will just spin out and do all kinds of crazy stuff and they want to ask a million questions. And it's like, listen, man, just do this for a period of time and then we're going to reevaluate and we'll tweak mm-hmm. and fiddle from there. But in a clinical application, I actually am much more of a dick. I have much less <laughs> latitude. But in trying to educate a lot of people, I definitely do want to convey that there's a lot of nuance to this. I definitely do have kind of my safe harbor. Like if I'm working with somebody and I'm busy enough now where I can basically say, hey, if you're going to work with me, it's going to be no grains, no legumes, no dairy, no artificial sweeteners. There we go. That's what I was expecting. <laughs> We're going to titrate in uh, carbohydrates based off of your recovery, and then we're going to monitor from there. So in my clinical practice, if I'm working directly with somebody, I do have some really tight lane lines, but there does need to be an understanding that there's a lot of latitude to this stuff. Right. And particularly when you're at home listening to the podcast rather than under the supervision of a professional. Yeah. And, you know, and again, if people could take away from this thing that there are some starter guidelines that I think are generally very, very good. But then we need to be able to tweak and fiddle and modify. And Okay, so I have two daughters raising these girls and I'm trying to figure out how to make them functional members of society and have their own <laughs> identity and all that stuff. And in the beginning, you really need to provide some lane lines for these kids. And if you don't, they are just little animals. They are just driven by impulse and they really... They can't make a choice about the way that they react to things. But if you can provide some lane lines initially, and then as they grow and develop, then you start telling them, hey, so these weren't actually rules that were written in stone kind of thing. These have just been things because you are a young person, you're growing now into an older person. Now, here's where all the nuance is. But to function in society, you need to know where the lane lines are. And then you can decide whether or not you want to stay in those lane lines and you can figure out how to modify that stuff. There have been some movies and some books written about this. What would work better, taking a modern man and sticking him in a Stone Age scenario or taking a Stone Age man and sticking him in a modern scenario? And the modern guy can probably adapt to that Stone Age scenario much more easily because he's kind of like, oh, this is the Stone Age. Somehow I transported through time and I need to figure out how to deal with this. Whereas the Stone Age guy is like, the gods hate me and I've been sent to <laughs> hell, basically. And that's the level of their adaptation. And when people are first starting into dietary and lifestyle changes, it's like a kid or it's like almost an animal that could become sapient but isn't yet. And you've got to start that person with really tight lane lines, really good parameters to be able to get them a sense of success and then you can kind of move them forward that's great you just brought me back to my childhood where until like age eight i thought that it was legally required for me to call all adults mr and their last name right it's like the lane lines weren't removed until i was like nine or ten and it started to become ridiculous right exactly Awesome. Rob, I want to ask you two more paleo questions and then I'll stop being completely greedy with your time today. <laughs> cool. We've talked about type 2 diabetes and we've talked about insulin resistance and all that stuff. And yet so many people, when they hear about paleo and they hear about your emphasis on fats and proteins over refined carbohydrates are inevitably going to scream heart disease and CVS and metabolic syndrome and all these horrible things. What do you tell these people? Because personally, I just want to grab them by the head and start shaking them. <laughs> it's like you're sitting there drinking a two liter Coke and you're telling me that I'm going to die of heart disease. How do you cope with these people? What would you tell them? That one gets thorny. You have some people kind of say out of the Gary Tobbs camp that say that all insulin resistance and whatnot is driven by excessive carbohydrate intake. Then you have someone like Stefan Guionet who really makes a very compelling case that it's not just carbohydrates, it's total calories. And uh, Stefan further makes the point that it's the change in the type of calories, the hyper palatability of our foods causing us to overeat. And I think that that's really the answer. We are still ultimately overeating. But then the question is, what do we need to do to fix that? And one of the easiest, and once you become hyperinsulinemic, what that means is that we are very poorly dealing with blood glucose and elevated levels of blood glucose can be very, very damaging. So 
what do we want to do? We want to control blood glucose. So I look at it a little bit like a sunburn analogy. If you've gotten too much sun, if you have a sunburn, you need to mitigate or decrease the amount of sun exposure you have. Similarly, if you're insulin resistant and have elevated blood glucose levels, if that was caused from too much carbs only or too many calories in total, causing the inflammatory stress cascade that leads to storing body fat and elevating insulin levels, whichever the case, a really good intervention to solving that is reducing carbohydrate load. Sure. And then filling it up with protein because it gives that great satiety. It's more satiating. And this is also where the dietary intervention that could reverse type 2 diabetes or prediabetes isn't necessarily the way that you're going to have to eat your whole life. If you can reverse that type 2 diabetic state or pre-diabetic state, then you might have more latitude with a, a cellular carbohydrates from yams and sweet potatoes and green bananas and maybe some soaked sprouted lentils or something like that. Or maybe not. It'll depend, but certainly it will avert the catastrophe that's going to happen if you do the standard model, which is eat a 60% carbohydrate diet and try to control this with metformin and insulin and stuff like that. Right. And so one of the things that I really loved, and actually, after listening to one of the earlier episodes of your podcast, I need to go get my LDL size tested, not just the overall cholesterol, because you've been really good about publicizing the fact that overall cholesterol doesn't tell too much. But this idea that uh, cholesterol and heart disease are not really directly correlated. And if they are, it's not about overall cholesterol. Yeah. And in our risk assessment program that we looked at here, we look at both the size and the LDL particle count. Yes. So it's really critical to get an LDLP. You can have somebody, you can have two people with LDLC, LDL cholesterols of 100. One person could have a particle count of 1,000. The other person could have a particle count of 2,000. The person with the thousand count is going to die from something, but it's not going to be cardiovascular disease. The person with the 2,000 count they're looking at a very high likelihood of some sort of cardiac event, stroke, something like that. And then we need to figure out, well, why is that elevated? And was right. it sleep? Is it gut permeability or whatever? And then we start doing the kind of functional medicine to figure that stuff out. But it's really important. You just really don't know if you're only looking at like total cholesterol, HDL, LDL cholesterol. It doesn't tell you enough to really make a, a thoroughly informed decision about that. Interesting, right? And it's still, there's a lot to be said about ratios, as I understand it. I mean, more than overall cholesterol. Yeah. Apparently yeah. not. <laughs> I won't bore you guys with the lipidology piece, but LDLP and systemic inflammatory markers plus insulin resistant status, I think is really kind of where the rubber hits the road on that stuff. And the ratios do end up mattering because say like your triglyceride to HDL ratio gives you a very good indication of insulin resistance. So there is some great information that can be garnered from that stuff, but it's uh, for pathogenesis of cardiovascular disease, that LDLP number and inflammatory markers are probably mm. a really big deal. I love yeah. it. Awesome. I'm going to schedule my blood test tomorrow. Yeah. Well, last paleo question, and then we'll get into a little bit more about what you're working on and how people can get in touch. Uh, one thing that really alarmed me about your book was the idea that it can take 10 to 15 days after a gluten exposure for the body to be right again and to get rid of this inflammation or this gut uh, permeability issue. Does this mean that uh, you don't really advocate a cheat day for kind of psychological health? Or if you do, how do you advocate it? Well, I don't like the term cheat anyway. I mean, we don't have a covenant with food. You can cheat on wives. You can cheat on <laughs> tests. We eat. And so I just detest the term cheated. Part of the problem with people is that they become emotional eaters. And so we use these terms like cheat and in my opinion, it's misplaced. If you want to have something, have it. Just be aware of the consequences. Sure. If you want to go gamble away, you've worked all week. I live in Reno and we have a bunch of casinos here. So you've worked all, all week. You deserve to go take care of yourself and you drink a bunch of booze, play the slot machines, and then take your uh, last $200 and get a <laughs> from one of the hookers at the brothels <laughs> who was past her expiration date 40 years ago. Fine, that's your prerogative. What are the consequences of that going to be? Right. <laughs> your next two weeks until you get a, a check are going to completely suck. So 
I just don't like any of this moralizing around it. It's like, let's put on our big girl panties and be adults about it. If you want to have something, then have it. There's all kinds of mitigation strategies. So on the gluten side, at this point, if you live in a most westernized places, you know, there's so many good options. Like you could have ice cream instead of gluten. You could sure. have dark chocolate instead of gluten. You could have a chocolate, you know, a flourless tort instead of gluten. I didn't realize dark chocolate was cheating. I've been eating it. You, you mentioned it on the podcast that it's okay. <laughs> yeah, well, that's kind of my point, but there's all this other stuff. So if you figure out that you're reactive to gluten, it's really one of the things that, you know, I really try not to moralize this stuff, but it's one of those things where I'm like, come on, man, you're being a moron. Like, this is ridiculous. It's almost, you have emphysema, but you're still smoking through a trach tube. Yeah. It's just dumb. Like, if you really react to gluten, and we know that uh, gluten exposure in susceptible people increases all kinds of different cancers, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer. I mean, it's really bad stuff. And we have all these other options. So why not, if you want to go out and have sushi, go have some sushi. If you want to have yeah. some Mexican food, do corn tortillas instead of flour tortillas. I mean, it's really not that big of a deal. And then from there, if you really want to kick your heels up, go do a full body strength training routine beforehand. A couple of burnout sets of squats and deadlifts and yeah. presses and pulls. And then you're super insulin sensitive and then you get to go have your great meal and you've totally mitigated the downside on that. And again, some people would say that that's just being totally neurotic because you're starting to pair exercise with eating. And maybe it is, but it's also a good risk mitigation kind of strategy that, I don't know, anything can be taken to an extreme, but I'll do stuff like that. If we're going to go out and get some sushi, I'll do air squats until my quads are super burning and do some push-ups and go do some pull-ups. And I'm like, okay, let's hit it. And we go get some sushi. And I know that the glucose disposal is better and my insulin sensitivity is going to be improved. And I really enjoyed the meal. So it doesn't seem Love like it. that big of a downside. That's a brilliant, brilliant kind of meet it halfway strategy. I don't think it sounds neurotic at all, to be honest. <laughs> Rob, someone on Twitter suggested that I should ask about your health insurance philosophy. Do I even want to ask? <laughs> oh, man, I uh, just really quickly, like I'm pretty market oriented. The United States is a, a funny place where we kind of have the shittiest elements of everything. Like we've taken a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And we're really in a mess right now. And we have this left right divide in the United States where people can't even talk anymore. They literally can't even have a conversation. And I tend to be kind of market driven. But I understand that a lot of people really feel that we have kind of a social charter to take care of people. And folks in the United States will hold up like the Northern European socialized democracies mm -hmm. and say, hey, this is what we should be emulating. And I've spent a lot of time in Denmark, a lot of time in Sweden. My family is from Sweden. I really understand these places well, and they are very laudable. But they are also almost completely ethnically and culturally homogenized Right. There's very little variation in it. Everybody follows the rules and uh, these things have historically worked pretty well. And all of these countries have had the benefit of a really massive demographic bubble that was very favorable in that there was a large number of youthful workers contributing to the social welfare pool to take care of a relatively small group of aged dependents. And that is all totally changing. And people are kind of scratching their heads about like, okay, how will the economics of this stuff play out? And folks in the United States are just blindingly ignorant of these, again, nuances. And so you have people more on the, the left-leaning side that will say everything needs to be socialized. We need socialized medicine. We need free school. We need all this type of stuff. And then you have people on the right who will say, if you can't figure out a way to get your own job, then you should die in the street kind of deal. So it's yeah. just really crazy polarization. And I've found a, a model out of Singapore, which is really interesting. It's a state mandated healthcare system that is based on health savings accounts. Right. Yeah, I was living in Singapore for a bit. Okay, there you go. So you put money into these health savings accounts. It's pre-tax dollars. All of the medical providers basically have a menu on their wall or on their website that describes what they offer and what things cost. And so there's a massive amount of competition between providers to provide the best value as far as goods and services at the best cost. And even people that are very, very poor, when they receive money from the state, 
it goes into an HSA account, and that is theirs to do with as they please from a medical standpoint. If those people die, that money is actually heritable to their heirs. It is theirs. And what I find is that if you have a society that is not perfectly homogenized and is not small, the United States has 12 cities that have a larger population right. than the Northern European democracy. So there's just economies of scale here that people do not understand. And say like in Switzerland, even though, again, it's a socialized democracy, most of their governance happens on the local municipal level. Everybody in the United States wants to push everything up to a federal level so that people in Virginia are forced to, to comply with things exactly the way that people in California are. And it's ridiculous. Sure. Like it, it's so ridiculous. So I really like decentralization. I like markets. And I feel like my idea with the healthcare thing is something that looks like the uh, Singapore model where we've got a safety net for people, but there's actually market signaling so that we have real prices and real feedback and the opportunity for innovation and growth. Versus our current system, we have largely a third-party payer system where, like, if I go to you as a doctor, somebody else pays for that interaction. And so, as the patient, I don't really care what it costs because somebody else is paying for it. And then you as the doctor are getting short-changed because the third-party payer is always trying to undercut you. So, you just continually increase your prices and there's this cat and mouse game going on there. You know, we don't buy cars like that. We don't buy bananas right. like that. We don't buy automobile insurance like that. Interesting. It's fascinating. And the, people may have liked some of what I had to say up until that point. And then it, I guarantee you, like, people will just lose <laughs> their minds and it's, it's just emotionality on par with like any type of religious discussion or something. No, but like, I'm glad you, I asked. It's a unique perspective, especially as someone who spends so much time helping people fight these chronic diseases that health insurance is supposed to help against. Yeah. So that's interesting. The United States military, and I work with the Naval Special Warfare Resiliency Program. I work with the SEALs and the special boat teams and stuff like that. And I've been at a number of these military events. Well, they talk about national security, but interestingly, for the United States, the military looks at our healthcare crisis as possibly our greatest national security threat. Really? And uh, more than ISIS, more than this, more than that. Because, I mean, we can bankrupt our economy. And if we bankrupt our economy, we're super screwed. Wow. Like, actually, the whole world is screwed because we're kind of the linchpin on that stuff for good or bad. But so they're really looking at this stuff. So if you have a, an iPhone in your hand, that iPhone is cheaper and better than the iPhone you had in your hand three years ago. And it will be more expensive and more paltry than the iPhone you'll have in your hand in three more years. Sure. There's this process called Moore's Law, where when markets and innovation are allowed to occur, things tend to get cheaper and better. We've seen this in a number of different industries. It doesn't describe everything under the sun, but it describes a lot of things. But we know more about pathology, physiology, genetics than we've ever known in history. In, in 2013 alone, there were 40,000 publications on PubMed that mentioned type 2 diabetes. Wow. But yet type 2 diabetes is increasing at an exponential rate. It actually started slowing down, like it started flattening out a little bit. But we know more about a host of disease pathologies than we've ever known in history but yet we seem completely incompetent at dealing with them. Wow. In my opinion, we're doing it, and it's very, very expensive to try to deal with this stuff. And my, again, greasy used car salesman sales pitch on that is that without this evolutionary biology background, we are just lost. We're just chasing symptoms, pills, potions, surgery, randomized control trials that are really not based from an epistemological perspective that it's going to really inform what we're up to. If we use that evolutionary biology perspective, sleep, food, exercise, gut biome, socialization, and we start couching our research from that perspective, then I, I think that we really have something powerful. And we did a, a two-year pilot study here in Reno with the Reno police, Reno firefighters, found 35 people at high risk for type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease, put them on a paleo diet, modified their sleep, got them exercising, and based off their cardiometabolic changes, we saved the city of Reno about $22 million with a really conservative 33 to 1 return on investment. Wow, that's incredible. So yeah, when I throw those ideas out about market-oriented healthcare solutions, it's not just an opinion piece like we've actually 
done something that nobody else has been able to do, not even close. Amazing. And we're trying to scale that up and take it out to the masses. Yeah. Amazing. Rob, last major question. What is one piece of homework that our audience should try this week, whether it's a thought experiment or going and getting some blood work done, or what's a nice piece of homework for people to act on this information? Try to get one hour more of sleep. Oh, that's brilliant. I literally just today interviewed Nick Littlehales, the guy who, I don't know if it's going to air before or after this episode, but he was great. He's the guy who does uh, sleep coaching for Real Madrid Arsenal. Nice. So yeah, awesome. I'm the food guy. Like most of my talks are about 80% sleep. It makes such a difference. It's incredible. We've done literally two episodes just on sleep. Yeah. All right. So we finally made it. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with me as I totally... Totally, man. That no, was a ton of fun. Awesome questions. When the questions are good, I love doing it. Oh, I thank you. So Rob, what are you working on now? I know you're doing something called City Zero. You're obviously doing the NorCal Strength and Conditioning. You're probably, I would imagine, writing a new book. Tell us what Rob Wolf is up to. I have a couple of books that I've been fiddling with for a while. Those are, you know, I chip away at them, but it's not a real hot and heavy timeline on those. My main focus is this City Zero project, which is basically taking this uh, Reno risk assessment program and trying to create a technology platform to take this out to the masses. Like we've talked to Twitter, we've talked to Tesla, we've had engagement from the FBI, from ATF, and uh, we have a lot of interest in this program. We just literally cannot accommodate the interest that if we were to sign a a deal with the FBI, we would fail in the contract on day one currently because our brick and mortar clinic would not be able to handle the volume. So what we're trying to do is create a technology interface that allows us to scale what we do in the clinic and be able to put 100,000 people a day through this program. And we're making some great progress on that. There will be a soup to nuts certification for strength and conditioning coaches and healthcare providers. The goal with this is to have an evolutionary health trained kind of medical and health system so that whether you go from the gym or the clinic or the hospital, you have people that are largely on the same page with looking at medicine from sleep, food, exercise, gut biome, socialization, so that we have some congruence there. So that's a big goal. The goal is to completely change the way that medicine is done in the United States. So no small goal. No small goal. I love it. I love the ambition. Yeah. And so how can people get in touch with you? Obviously, I've done the plugging for your book because I'm such an advocate of it, The Paleo Solution. Obviously, your podcast by the same name, Paleo Solution Podcast. I'm a huge fan. But where else can we send people? And what are some things that they should check out that are more recent? Because apparently, I'm a little outdated in my Rob Wolf uh, chronology. Oh, man, uh, just robwolf.com. We have a list of kind of the most popular, most important blog posts and podcasts. Also, if people sign up for my newsletter, they will automatically, they'll get a series of auto newsletters. I think it's like 20 long or something like that, that brings in kind of like, well, what is paleo and what's the deal with carbs? And so we end up kind of titrating out a lot of that information that, you know, I've maybe had some different insights since writing the book. And so they go to robwolf.com, sign up for the free newsletter. You get some free swag with that. And then you definitely stay up to date on all the the latest uh, Rob Wolf City Zero stuff. Excellent. All right. So we will put a link to that in the show notes. But for those who don't check it out, Rob Wolf with two Bs. And Rob, I really, really want to thank you. You've been so generous with your time. And I know uh, you've been so busy. So I really appreciate you making the time. Oh, well, thanks, man. I really appreciate the work you're doing. And uh, I've got to say, I've had a ton of interviews. I'm always honored and grateful for all of them. But this was probably the most thoughtful, best thought out questions that I've ever had. So thank you very much. Wow, that's a huge yeah. compliment, Rob, especially coming from you. So thank you very, very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Yeah, let's keep in touch. Hey, I'm going to figure out if I can send you a kombucha scoby. And I, I want to know about these books you're working on. So do keep in touch. Okay, sounds good. All right. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. All right, super friends. That's it for this week's episode. We hope you really, really enjoyed it and learn a ton of applicable stuff that can help you go out there 
and overcome the impossible. If so, please do us a favor and leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or however you found this podcast. In addition to that, we are always looking for great guest posts on the blog or awesome guests right here on the podcast. So if you know somebody or you are somebody or you have thought of somebody who would be a great fit for the show or for our blog, please reach out to us either on Twitter or by email. Our email is info at becomingasuperhuman.com. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in to the Becoming Superhuman podcast. For more great skills and strategies or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.becomingasuperhuman.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time.